Hi guys and welcome back to another True Crime and Make Time video. First and foremost, I wanted to wish my beautiful friends out there a very Merry Christmas. Christmas is honestly one of my favorite times of the year and just having kids, it just makes it even better. So everyone out there, I hope you guys just honestly have the most beautiful celebrations with your friends and family and eat the best food. I used to be about presents and I still kind of am. It's fun, you know, to receive presents. Who doesn't love giving and receiving presents? But now for me, it's more about watching my kids' faces, spending time with my family. So I hope you guys honestly have the most amazing time. And now moving on to something that's not so merry. Jay and I recently, we were talking about parents who seek revenge on their child's killers. And that just got me thinking, I think I've done one case on that. And I was like, I wonder if there are any more cases like this. Interesting ones. I read a little snippet about today's case and I was hooked. I delved so deep into it. I was like, what is this about? Guys, this is the most interesting case. Imagine you get married, but this marriage ends in a horrible divorce and custody battles. Your wife cheated on you and has remarried her lover. You then have to send your children to go live with your ex-wife and her new husband. Then one day you get a phone call from your ex-wife. Your daughter is dead. There's no real explanation, no real investigation. People who are meant to help you don't. It looks like a cover-up. What do you do? This case is the most amazing portrayal of a father's love and how he would stop at nothing to get his child justice. This case is extremely long, extremely detailed because it spans over 30 years. So today I wanted to give you the shorter version and the main facts and it's just wild. So let's get into it. Andre Bamberski was born in 1937 in Le Quenois, France. His family was originally from Poland, but during World War II, the Germans deported them to Germany, but then back to Poland. Around the age of 10, Andre moves back to France and then he continues on with his studies and then eventually becomes a chartered accountant. He joins the military after school and then at age 25, he moves to Casablanca in Morocco. In 1965, he meets a woman named Danielle Gonin in a crepery and she was tall, she was pretty, she was pleasant. Danielle, who had just turned 20 years old, she was the daughter of French expats and they had moved to Morocco in the 1950s. Andre and Danielle, they soon fell in love and in the early 1960s, they got married and they went on to have two children. They had a daughter named Kalinka who was born on 7th August 1967 and then they went on to have another child, a boy named Nicholas who was born in 1972. Now they had a really nice life as a family until after Nicholas was born. Danielle, she suddenly started listening to German music and reading German books. Andre obviously found this really odd, really suspicious so they ended up having a conversation. Danielle then informs him that their neighbor Three doors down, Dr. Dieter Krombach was her lover. Around that time, the family, they got into a pretty serious car accident. And Danielle, she gets out of the car to search for help. And there Dieter was. He had been following the family. Now, Kalinka had been hurt pretty badly. So I believe Dieter took Kalinka to the hospital where she was treated for a concussion and he visited her weirdly every day. Due to this infidelity, in 1974, the family decided to leave Morocco. They moved to France and they settled in a commune called Peshbusque and this was close to where Danielle had grown up. They decided to do this to start over as a family. Then, less than a year later, in 1975, Danielle approaches Andre and tells him about this job opportunity in a real estate office in Nice. Now, Nice was about seven hours away. She tells Andre that she planned to rent an apartment there during the week where she would attend work and then come home on the weekends. But oddly enough, she refused to give Andre the name or any contact details of this real estate firm. Andre was like, okay, so 
One Sunday evening, he decided to follow Danielle. She was due to return back to her apartment in Nice and, you know, attend work for the week. So as he's following her, instead of driving seven hours to Nice, she drives 20 minutes to an apartment in Toulouse. So they arrive at this apartment building and she goes inside and parks her car in the garage. I guess he would go there every week instead of confronting her that Sunday night because he knew that she was there in Toulouse for that entire week. So one day he goes into the apartment building and he speaks with the doorman and he asks him about Danielle. And the man responds, oh, that's Madame Krombach. Dieter Krombach was born in 1935 in Dresden, Germany. He soon became a doctor and he married and he had two children. In 1974, he was living on the same street as Andre and Danielle in Casablanca. And Dieter, he was a physician to the German consulate. And Andre and Danielle's kids attended the same international school that Dieter's kids attended. And it was through these connections that... Danielle and Dieter began their affair. This story kind of takes place over all these different towns and cities, but I believe after Morocco, when Andre and Danielle moved to Peche Busk in France, uh, Dieter moved to Bavaria in Germany with his kids, but then I believe he rented this apartment in Toulouse, France during the week. So I'm not sure if he lived there without his kids during the week. I'm thinking he did so that him and Danielle could kind of have their affair. So I'm guessing Danielle, she would travel to Toulouse from Pesh Busk, which was like 20 minutes or something. And then Dieter would travel 14 hours back to Bavaria to spend time with his kids. I don't know when he would do that, but that's what the travel times looked like. It's worth noting too that Dieter was persistent in his pursuit of Danielle, that he was in love with her and would do anything to have her. He vowed to follow her wherever she went. And I believe that's why he bought this apartment in Toulouse, France, because Danielle and her family had moved to France from Morocco. And his persistence paid off because he spent enough time with Danielle that she eventually fell in love with him too. He was a well-respected doctor who was good at what he did. He was handsome and he was really charming. So obviously following this affair continuing, Andre, he quickly filed for divorce from Danielle and took custody of the two children, Kalinka and Nicholas. But their divorce did not end on good terms. I mean, the marriage ended due to cheating, so it was not an amicable divorce. But I guess Danielle, she was in mad love because she moved with Dieter to Bavaria. She gave up her custody rights to Andre and the kids stayed with their dad, Andre, in France. Then Danielle and Dieter soon got married in 1977. And at the time, Dieter, he was married to his second wife, whom he left so that he could be with Danielle. I always find it so hard to believe when it's the moms that give up their custody rights to their kids because I'm like, what makes you do that? You know, you're the one that carried the child most of the time and, you know, you might have a closer connection. So what makes you give up your rights? Are you just so madly in love with the other person? Do you just want to start another life? Maybe it's hard being a mom. Maybe there's postpartum issues. Like, who knows? And I know some people don't want children, but I find it so hard to believe when you already have a child to just be like, no, thanks. Now, one thing to note about Dieter, his first wife's name was Monica Hentz, and he began dating her when he was 25 years old, and she was around 15 years old. In 1963, when Monica turned 18, she got pregnant, and they had an abortion because they weren't ready to have a child. But later that year, they went on to get married and have two children, a daughter named Diana and a son named Boris. Then in 1969, Monica suffered from an unknown illness that caused her to become paralyzed, mute and blind. Then suddenly at the age of 24, Monica passed away. After this, Monica's family alleged that Dieter had abused Monica throughout their marriage, that he had made threats to her life. During Monica's final hours at the hospital, Dieter inserted himself 
between the doctors and the nurses so that he could access his wife and injected her with what he claimed to be snake venom. And shortly after this injection, she died. The official cause of death was listed as a cerebral hemorrhage and no definitive connection was ever made between the injection that her husband administered and her death. Dieter was never charged with any crime connected to Monica's death. In July 1980, Andre decides to return to Morocco with the kids. Days after he left France, Danielle files a complaint against him in a Toulouse court demanding custody of the two children. Andre was advised by his attorneys not to challenge Danielle's motion, and this was because his ex-wife's civil case included an accusation of non-presentation of children. And I'm not sure if that's because she had visitation rights with the kids. And then now he's obviously, you know, removed the children to another country and she can no longer visit. So the court would have possibly ruled in Danielle's favor because he did this without any discussions. So Andre then ends up moving back to Petchbusk with the kids in France and the kids then eventually went to live with Danielle and Dieter in Lindau in Germany. Andre agreed to only see the children during vacations. By now, Kalinka was 14 years old. She was outgoing. She was gorgeous, blonde hair, blue eyes. She had been living with her mother and stepfather in Germany, but she barely spoke any German. And she was looking forward to return back to Petschbusk to visit with her father and stay with him during the vacation term. She was homesick and she missed her father. And at the time she was attending a French language high school in the small city of Freiburg in Germany. And it was a boarding school. So she spent her weekdays there. And then on the weekends, she spent her time in Lindau with her mother and her stepfather Dieter. At this time, Andre was 44 years old and he was a successful accountant and he had finally entered into a new relationship seven years after his divorce from Danielle. He was about to begin a new stage of life but all of his plans would come to an abrupt end. On 10th July 1982 at about 10 30 a.m. Andre gets a call from Danielle. She tells him Kalinka is dead. Andre is stunned what? How? Why? Kalinka was 14 years old, nearly 15, young, healthy, athletic, no serious health issues. She was a skier, a windsurfer, an ice skater. Danielle tells him her husband, Dieter, being a doctor, had two theories. One was that Kalinka died of a heat stroke. And two, she possibly died from delayed effects of that concussion she received when she was young in that car accident. Andre was not buying his theories. So what happened that day? That day, Kalinka windsurfed on Lake Constance and came home at around five o'clock. According to Danielle and Dieter, Kalinka then tells them that she's not feeling so good and she was pretty tired. They then had dinner at around 7.30 p.m. and then Kalinka went to bed early. Three hours later at around 10 p.m., Dieter goes into Kalinka's room to check on her and she wakes up and she drinks a glass of water. And then according to Dieter again, she reads in her room until midnight. He says he knew this because at around midnight, he saw that her light was still on and he went into her room and told her to turn off the light and just go to bed. The next day before 10 a.m., Dieter was getting ready to go for his morning horse ride and, you know, what a life. And he was wearing his equestrian clothes and he goes into Kalinka's room to wake her up. That is when he found her lying in her bed on her right side, stiff with rigor mortis. It was Dieter who found Kalinka unconscious. It was Dieter who called the emergency services. Dr. Jobst was the first one to arrive on scene to examine Kalinka. Dieter tells this doctor that the night before he had injected Kalinka with a compound that he did not name to help Kalinka tan more easily. Then at midnight when he visited her and found that she was still awake, he gave her a sleeping tablet to help her sleep. Later, Dieter would tell medical examiners that he tried to revive 
Kalinka with another injection directly into our heart this time of Coramin, which was a central nervous system stimulant, dopamine, and an opioid used to treat severe pain. But he claims he was hours too late and her time of death was pronounced to be between the hours of 3 a.m. and 4 a.m. However, these details would not be shared with Andre for a really long time. In the meantime, an autopsy on Kalinka was conducted on 12th July 1982 by two doctors named Homan and Doman. A few people, including Andre, have claimed that Dieter was in the room at the time the autopsy was being conducted. And this is against, obviously, all rules. The German authorities, however, maintain that Dieter was never present during the autopsy and that he only spoke to Dr. Homan after the autopsy was conducted, even though in the autopsy report, Dr. Homan um, quotes Dieter in such a way that Dieter is present during the autopsy in real time. Dieter's lawyer insisted that Dieter only went into the autopsy room to identify Kalinka's body and he wasn't present during the actual procedure. So the autopsy report is pretty, um, I guess, graphic. So skip if you're sensitive to this, but I'm going to read you what the autopsy report said. So the report noted, amongst other things, fresh blood around her a tear in her vulva and a white substance inside her. And there was undigested food in her stomach. Food was found in her throat, esophagus and lungs, indicating that Kalinka choked on her own vomit. She had multiple needle puncture marks, one on the right arm, right leg and thorax. The one on her right arm was caused by an intravenous injection of cobalt, Feralicit, a controversial iron supplement at the time. And in the report, Dieter admitted to giving her this iron supplement before dinner on Friday evening, supposedly to help her tan. Now, he would later change his story that he had given her this iron injection to treat her for anemia, which she was never diagnosed with. And then it was also later found that Dieter had also injected Kalinka with a few other drugs namely Novitigal, Isoptin, and Cortisone. The combination of these drugs that he injected into her is dangerous and inexplicable to medical experts. Now, although Dr. Homan, the guy conducting the autopsy report, noted and understood that these multiple injections that were given to Kalinka made no sense in combination to help Kalinka, to help revive her, they did not conduct any toxicology tests. His estimated time of death was eight hours after Kalinka had dinner. So that doesn't explain the undigested food in her stomach, meaning food would normally digest in that many hours at that point. Dr. Harmon did not analyze or test the white substance found inside Kalinka. Even though the injuries on her vulva indicated sexual assault, and people have claimed they did not even determine if Kalinka was a virgin, which I guess back then is like an old school test, you know, to check if her, if her hymen was intact. The report claims there was no signs of sexual violence found. And then the report stated the cause of death as unknown. The two doctors stated that Kalinka probably died due to heart failure, and they did not offer an explanation as to why her body was in an advanced state of decomposition. The case was closed. Now, Andre knew none of this until three months later when he finally received a copy of the autopsy report. And then when he received it, it was in German. So then he had to have it translated, which delayed his knowledge even further. Why wasn't he told about the injections administered to Kalinka, the injuries to her genitals, the lack of a toxicology report. All this was enough for Andre to come to the conclusion that Dieter was responsible for his daughter's death and sexual abuse, but apparently it was not enough for the German authorities. They did not even interview Dieter, but they got his version of events through a telephone call. No further questions were asked of Dieter, despite him 
admitting to entering Kalinka's room so many times, administering her with so many drugs without her mother's permission. No further questions were asked of Dieter, despite him admitting to entering Kalinka's room so many times, the cocktail of medications he injected into her, also without her mother's permission. The other members of the family present in the home were not even interviewed at all. A criminal investigation was never launched and the case had already been closed. Andre felt like he failed his child. He was unable to protect Kalinka. It was then that Andre's quest for justice began. So Andre calls Danielle to ask her about the lack of testing. And I believe samples of the injuries to her genitals were taken at the autopsy, but no one knows what happened to those. Where were the findings? So Danielle tells him she's gonna speak to Dieter and then give Andre a call back. She never did. So Andre chases her up and says, look, three months after Kalinka's death, the case is closed. No one cares about a 14 year old's random death. And Danielle responds to Andre and says, Kalinka died because it was her time to die. Now, Andre could not accept that. He had spoken to other doctors who also queried why a 14 year old girl who had torn, who had fluid found inside her that resembled was never tested to see if she had ever had sex before. The doctors also told him that it looked like a cover-up. Andre agreed and it was his theory that Dieter had raped his daughter Kalinka and had killed her with an injection to silence her. Dieter claimed that Andre was crazy and he was just seeking revenge because of the affair that he had with his ex-wife. Dieter's lawyers claim that the damage to Kalinka's genitals happened during the autopsy. They claimed that it was July, it was very hot, and her body was decomposing faster than usual, which made it extremely fragile. Then in terms of Kalinka's burial, Andre and Danielle, they had back and forth arguments about where to bury Kalinka. And then they eventually agreed that she should be buried in Pech Busk. And then suddenly the next day, and this is wild guys, the next day, Danielle calls Andre and she's like, I thought we agreed to bury Kalinka in Pech Busk. Why is the prosecutor calling me, telling me, saying that you told them that they should go ahead and cremate Kalinka? And Andre's like, what? I never gave anyone permission to cremate Kalinka. So Andre calls and he has the arrangements that had begun to cremate Kalinka stopped. This was weird. What was happening? Because if Kalinka was cremated, all the evidence would be destroyed. Was it the case of German authorities looking out for Dieter? Did Dieter have accomplices or was Dieter completely innocent? Andre obviously found the whole thing really sus and he had his theory. So he began to pressure the German authorities to reopen the case and investigate the possible involvement of her stepfather Dieter in Kalinka's death. And now when I say pressure, I mean, that's literally all he seemed to spend his time on. He pushed and pushed and pushed. It's now 1983 and Dieter's family and Kalinka's mom and Kalinka's brother are finally questioned. Diana and Boris, who were Dieter's kids, they gave no helpful information apart from the fact that Kalinka had possibly told Boris at one point in time that she was not tanning fast enough. Danielle tells police that she was aware that Dieter was giving Kalinka uh, iron injections to help with her anemia, but then she later on contradicted herself saying that Kalinka was completely healthy. Nicholas, Kalinka's brother, stated that Kalinka was absolutely fine the night she died. There was nothing wrong with her. She was completely healthy and he was adamant that Dieter never gave Kalinka an injection to help her tan more easily that night, even though he had been apparently doing so for the past two years. Andre at this point was begging for the case to be reopened, but he was denied. It's like no one wanted to even know how Kalinka died. No one was interested. They just wanted the case closed. At this point, Andre is desperate. The Germans are not cooperating. So he decided to set off to Lindau. Once Andre arrived there, he began 
going in the streets, handing out flyers that depicted Dieter, the doctor, to be a racist and a murderer. He openly began claiming that police were trying to cover up the murder of his daughter. I believe it was Dieter's kids who actually turned Andre into the police and Dieter was furious. Together with Danielle, they sued Andre for defamation. Dieter and Danielle actually won this case against Andre and Andre was ordered to pay Dieter compensation in the amount of half a million German marks, which is around $200,000. Then finally in 1985, the French decided to open an investigation on Kalinka's death. Kalinka's body was exhumed. And on 4th December 1985, a second autopsy was conducted in France. Now, the most disturbing revelation in this second autopsy is that Kalinka's genitals were removed altogether during the first autopsy. And if that wasn't enough, they completely disappeared. They have never been seen again. And I know that sounds really strange for someone's genitals to disappear, but the reason why it's so baffling is that now that the second autopsy is being conducted, her genitals couldn't, couldn't be examined. When the German authorities were questioned about this, they claimed that they placed all of Kalinka's organs back in with Kalinka's body and they could not explain where Kalinka's genitals went. I mean, how wild is that? Like, where? How, how do you misplace human body parts, especially human body parts that, you know, need to be examined? Like, it's just so shady. However, the evidence that was left behind, meaning the food that was found in her throat, her esophagus, her lungs, this evidence led the French pathologists to believe that they could come to almost a near certain conclusion that Kalinka did die in a brutal manner, that she would have choked to death almost immediately after Dieter administered that injection into her right arm. Now, the lack of evidence couldn't provide a definitive answer, but it was enough for the French to charge Dieter with a crime. By Dieter's own admissions, he kept a bunch of mistresses and carried out multiple affairs in his own home. He allegedly would also drug Danielle, his wife, so that he could have these affairs downstairs in his home while Danielle slept. In 1989, Danielle found out about these affairs, in particular, one that Dieter was having with a 16-year-old girl, and she filed for divorce and moved back to France, but she still supported Dieter. In 1992, Dieter marries his fourth wife. Her name was Elke Frolik, who was like his three previous spouses, a decade younger than him. And they soon divorced after they got married because Dieter just couldn't keep it in his pants. He just kept having affairs all over the place. So the French trial went on for years and I don't exactly know why, but it just went on for a long time. And I'm guessing it was because it was so complicated with Germany and the evidence and trying to, you know, get information back and forth. So it was 1988 that the French pathologists determined that uh, Kalinka had died due to Dieter giving her the injection, which caused her to go into shock, which caused her to vomit up her food, choke and die. But it was only on 8th April 1993, right, that the prosecutor charged Dieter with a crime, which was voluntary homicide, which was punishable by up to 30 years in prison. They claimed that Dieter gave Kalinka a mortal injection, not to cure her, but to kill her. And they couldn't prove the rape of Kalinka because of her missing genitals. Now, the trial obviously was taking place in France and Dieter was like, I'm not coming back to France. So the French prosecutor asks the German authorities to bring Dieter, surrender him over to France and the German authorities refused. So what happened? Years went by. So then on March 9th, 1995, Dieter was convicted of murder in absentia 
at the Corps d'Assises in Paris and sentenced to 15 years in prison. This, however, didn't mean anything to Dieter though, because the German authorities were like, well, we've closed this case over here, so I don't know what the French trial over there is all about. Like, who cares? Dieter continued to live a socially and physically active life, an affluent life of status and wealth. Even though Dieter was given a 15-year prison sentence, technically he never had to serve his sentence as long as he stayed out of France. Andre was waiting for Dieter to pay his dues, but the political blocks were way too strong. But Dieter's name, Andre's name, Kalinka's name is now in the news, right? So due to all the hoopla, in 1997, Dieter was arrested for drugging and a 16-year-old female patient. This 16-year-old patient had come in for an examination, but his assistant was at lunch. I believe the 16-year-old came in alone. So he tells her, you know, this examination is going to hurt you. So he offered her a sedative. She agrees and he gives her this sedative through an IV. The 16-year-old girl knocks out. When she kind of wakes up, she sees Dieter, her doctor, is naked and on top of her. She could not believe what was happening, but she was almost paralyzed is what is how she explains it. So I believe Dieter didn't know that she woke up or he just kind of believed that she was going to remain silent. So he was the one that personally drops her home. Once she's home, she immediately tells her parents what had happened at the doctor's office. After this girl came forward, five more victims came forward, but their cases were rejected by the German authorities due to lack of forensic evidence. Some of these girls, they had been on horse riding trips with Dieter, and I'm not sure how this even took place. But during these trips, they would share a bed with Dr. Dieter. And back then, iron injections were really popular. And these girls were iron uh, deficient and they needed to be treated regularly. So Dieter would treat them by injecting these girls with who knows what really. The girls would fall asleep and the assaults would begin. These girls would be paralyzed either with fear, drugs, combination of both and they remain silent. For this 16 year old girl's case, Dieter receives a two year suspended sentence and he is banned from practicing medicine for two years as well. A slap on the wrists, really, it's a joke. In a rare TV interview, Dieter, he is heard mocking the victim and showing no remorse. He says, and I quote, she never said yes, but she never said no either. When I kissed her, she kissed back. He laughed. The presenter pointed out that he had drugged his victims. You know, she wasn't just like a voluntary partner. You had drugged her. And he responds, like they say in ancient Rome, those who remain silent seem to agree. It's it's truly evil. Andre never stopped. He followed Dieter wherever he went. He had multiple people keeping an eye on Dieter. These people would update Andre on where Dieter's location was. And one day, Andre, he literally goes up to Dieter's door, like his home, and he knocks on the door. And when Dieter opens up, he tells him, I'm going to get you. I will one day. In 2001, okay, the verdict that was reached by the French courts that was annulled, okay, by the European Court of Human Rights. And this what this happened because Dieter had not been able to defend himself in that trial. I mean, he chose not to attend France for the trial because he was a coward. And because of this, because it was annulled, he received a compensation of 100,000 francs. So when the German court finally convicted him of, of that 16-year-old patient, um, even though he received a laughable two-year suspended sentence, what was even a bigger joke is that he only served 11 months of that sentence. He was released early, you know, but then his uh, license to practice medicine was withdrawn for life and he continued to be an asshole, cocky, arrogant, saying that the 16-year-old wanted it and 
the session with him was all over within five minutes. So, you know, nothing to cry about. He then said that Andre was crazy and he didn't need to, and I quote, make love to his daughter. He was happy with the mother. I mean, if, like, Andre is not accusing you, dickhead, of making love to his daughter. It was her. Then in 2006, a documentary called Kalinka's Last Journey came out and was broadcast in Germany. And a woman in Bavaria recognized Dieter from the documentary. He was her doctor. This woman wrote to three different authorities notifying them that Dieter was still practicing medicine. And she also wrote to Andre. Dieter was continuing to practice medicine illegally all throughout Germany using false documents. Then police find him because of this woman's reports and he was found with a suitcase full of money and a penis pump. And a penis pump essentially helps men to get a boner, if you didn't know. This time he served 18 months in prison for practicing medicine without a license. Andre continued keeping tabs on Dieter, but time was running out. Authorities were telling him that nothing more could be done. He was sensing his window was closing. France had a 30 year limit on legal procedures. So Andre put up advertisements near the German border asking for help in transporting Dieter from Germany to France. One of the people that responded was a man named Anton Krasnicki. And this is wild, you guys. So this whole time we're talking about, you know, a murder of a young girl. And now we move on to a kidnapping. So Anton meets with Andre and Anton is like fascinated by Andre, right? Anton was a father himself and he felt like Andre was an exceptional dad. Anton was like, what would I do as a father if someone had done this to my daughter? Anton stated that if Kalinka was his daughter, Dieter would have received a short trial. Tidy, short, quick. So Anton agreed to transport Dieter to France for Andre, but he refused to take any payment for the kidnapping. Anton had ties to a Russian gang. On Sunday, October 18th, 2009, Anton, Katja, Boblovani, and Ivan kidnapped Dr. Dieter Krumbach while he was near Lake Constance, not far from the Austrian border. Dieter was put into a car and he was driven to Mulhouse in France. On the way there, Anton had to let go of one of the Russian men who were meant to be helping him because this man had a knife and wanted to cut off Dieter's genitals. That was not the plan. So a few hours later, Dieter was gagged, tied, and he was left with a head injury and he was left behind a gate in the city just meters away from the courthouse. So when Andre is informed by Anton that Dieter is there, he's ready, waiting on a silver platter for the French authorities. Andre calls Mulhouse officials. And at first they didn't believe Andre. They then go to the location that Andre tells them to go to. And then they find Dieter and he's like beaten up really badly. So they said to him, Andre, you know, you've beat him up really badly and you've left him here. And Andre was like, no, I didn't because I'm in Tullaus. So how can they really say that, you know, Andre was responsible for beating up Dieter? He wasn't even in the same city at the time, right? So Andre then travels to Mullaus because he, you know, wanted to ensure that Dieter was going to be tried. But when he arrives in Mulhaus, he was arrested for kidnapping. Andre admits to the kidnapping of Dieter because he was like, hello, I'm over here doing your job for you in order for him to even be handed over to the French authorities. Andre's risking his own freedom doing this. Then when he arrives at the police station, you know, to be questioned about the kidnapping, the police officers that were in the station stand up and they all clapped for Andre. He was released on bail and he had to surrender his passport. Dieter was taken to be treated for his injuries and then placed in police custody. On October 21st, 2009, he was transferred to the hospital because his injuries were so severe. The trial for Kalinka's murder took place between 4th October 2011 and 22nd October 2011. Dieter, who was 76 years old at the time, frail, but still handsome to a lot of people, was taken from the prison hospital to the courtroom. And then when he was in the courtroom, he was placed behind bulletproof 
Glass. His three kids, Diana, Boris, and then his third daughter, her name was Katya, who was from his fourth marriage. They all sat in the courtroom in support of their father and the case was being followed by thousands. So the court hears all the evidence and they found that the injuries to Kalinka's labia, the tears and the blood and everything, could have only taken place when Kalinka was still alive. So they did not agree with Dieter's lawyer's theory that the injuries to her genitals took place during the autopsy. They also declared that the white fluid found inside Kalinka could only be semen, that Kalinka had been drugged the night of her death. Three German victims of Dieter described how they had been sedated and raped by him. A psychiatrist who examined Dieter while he was in prison portrayed him as a classic narcissist driven by the desire to influence others through charm or chemical means. The court heard from his kids who swore that Dieter was innocent. They then heard from Danielle. Now, I was like, Danielle has stayed quiet throughout all these decades, you know, in support of Dieter. But at his trial, she finally went against him. She had learned of some of the disturbing things that were taking place in her own home while she was married to Dieter. She stated, I learned that he gave me sleeping pills to have sex with women in our house. When you've done it once, you can do it other times. For sure, it puts some doubts why I slept so much that night. Now, that night she was referring to as the night that Kalinka died because she said the next day when Kalinka was found, she woke up naturally much later than she normally would. She went on to say, if he decided he wanted something, nothing could stop him. He chose me because I was married, which represented an additional challenge for him. He was especially attracted to girls in their early teens. She called this attraction the lure of the forbidden. Then Nicholas testified, Kalinka's brother, and he explained how Kalinka was fine the night she died. She had no issues. She didn't say she was unwell. He said, how can Dieter be satisfied with no answers to an unexplainable death? How as a doctor, Dieter never tried to find out how Kalinka truly died. That when he found out about the crimes that Dieter had committed against other girls of similar ages to Kalinka, he was convinced of Dieter's guilt. And he also claimed that he too was possibly drugged the night that Kalinka died. Then on 22nd October, 2011, Dieter makes a statement saying, I swear before the court and before Madame Gonin that I never harmed Kalinka. Madame Gonin is Danielle, Kalinka's mom, and the verdict was in. Dieter Krombach was found guilty of voluntary violence leading to unintentional death with aggravated circumstances. The crime was punishable by up to 30 years in prison. Dieter only got 15 years in prison. Dieter's lawyers went on to make multiple appeals to no avail. On 24th May, 2014, Andre's trial for the kidnapping of Dieter began. The public prosecutor requested six months in jail for Andre. And Andre confessed to wanting to have Dieter kidnapped, but not hurt. He was then given a one year suspended jail term. Andre was also ordered to pay an amount to Dieter for compensation for all the violence that he suffered. The three men who kidnapped Dieter were only ordered to pay like 6,000 euros in damages for kidnapping him and causing him the violence. Dieter's lawyers continued to apply for release using almost every possible excuse, especially his ailing health and his age. And finally, on February 21st, 2020, Dieter is released from prison due to his health. And I just don't get how that's allowed. Why is that allowed? Does anyone know in, in those countries? And Dieter ends up going back to Germany. And on September 12th, 2020, Dieter Krombach died in an old age home at the ripe old age of 85. So that bit was quite, so that part was kind of annoying that he got what, February to September, like six months of freedom in his old age. When Andre visited Kalinka's 
grave after the trial, he said, Kalinka, you see, I promised that I would give you justice. Now you can rest in peace. Oh man, the feels. Wasn't this a wild ride, guys? And I highly recommend watching the Netflix special on this case. It's called uh, My Daughter's Killer because um, some finer details are discussed in that and it's nice to kind of hear it from, you know, the person who did all the hard work, Andre. And yeah, most of all to watch it and see and feel Andre's determination, his will to get justice for his daughter. I believe later on in total, 16 women came forward with claims of abuse against Dieter. That's the amount of women who remember the assault, you know, women who possibly woke up during the drugging. Maybe the dose wasn't, you know, perfect for them and they woke up and saw what Dieter was doing to them. How many were there really? How many never woke up during the assault? How many had no idea their memories were wiped with the drugs that were being given to them over what period of time? It's always weird to me when I hear about people drugging their victim and then assaulting them. Like, what kind of loser are you? Like, do you feel good? Your victim is literally lying there helpless. Do you feel like a powerful person? So dumb. How about Dieter got drugged, right? And then Andre could have had his way with him. That should have been his punishment. Then Andre, this sweet man, like he makes me all emotional, all in my feels because there's so much at play here. Three decades of fighting. Was it worth it? At the end of the documentary, he does talk about how, you know, a fight is a fight and it takes a lot out of you. Some people would claim that, you know, Andre wasted his life fighting for this. And some people say, you know, he has another child, Nicholas, still left. And yeah, I agree. I I would hope that Andre, you know, doesn't regret anything, that he did spend a lot of his time with Nicholas and cherished those times with his child that was alive. But when something like this happens, when someone takes your child away, is there really much of a life left to live? And I would say yes, especially when you have other surviving children, but you can imagine if you're a parent what Andre fought for. It's honestly such a crazy story. Let me know your thoughts down below, guys. I hope you enjoyed today's video. I'm so sorry if some of you could hear like background noise. It's driving me crazy. My neighbor decided to mow all the lawns in the freaking area. And I can't even be mad because he mowed our like nature strip. So <sighs> sorry if that was annoying, but I love you guys. Merry Christmas. And I hope you have the best holiday period. I will see you in next week's video. Besitos. Bye.